Well, you've heard us talking sometimes at length about euthanasia or voluntary assisted dying. These laws are already in our six states. You've already heard us talking about a slippery slope where those warm and fuzzy, seemingly compassionate stories uh, move towards worst-case scenario nightmare policies, leaving vulnerable people at risk. We're turning our attention today to the latest developments in state-sanctioned suicide. Stephen McAlpine is an award-winning Christian author, a pastor and national commentator for City Bible Forum. Hey Stephen, a special welcome along to 2020. Thanks Neil, good to be with you. Hey Steve, activists who promote euthanasia or state-sanctioned suicide only ever tell us moving, uh, sometimes sort of sob stories, uh, cases that tear at the heartstrings, masking reality of what might be ahead. What are your thoughts about the way Australians tend to perceive this issue of euthanasia? Well, I think the first thing you'd want to say is that the euthanasia debate has been placed into the context of personal autonomy. If you think about the fact that euthanasia is going to be more prevalent in the decades ahead, we think, oh, that's because everyone's uh, nasty and evil and mean, but it will be painted as a personal autonomy story. And I think that's critical to understand. So the framework is that conversation. Okay, personal autonomy, and uh, that's got a certain positive ring about it, and we all want to have personal autonomy, and there might be different ways to be able to define that. There's been a story, though, a clear demonstration of how euthanasia can spiral out of control. You've been following one that's come out of the Netherlands. Yeah, well, it does seem that the Netherlands often has these stories because it's probably one of the most progressive frameworks for euthanasia. And you can probably decide that what is happening there now will be happening here in 20 years time so with a young dutch woman 29 year old zaria terbeek uh, received a final approval to for assisted dying uh, for having a, a mental health disorder that she thought was deep suffering and uh, she was able to go ahead with that actually so the article that i first saw i thought i better check this out did it actually happen and it actually did on may the 23rd that for an ongoing mental health issue, a 29-year-old woman, otherwise healthy, was allowed to go through state-sanctioned uh, voluntary dying or uh, assisted suicide. Now, the interesting points there to draw attention to, the fact that she's only 29 years old, uh, that's obviously going to be significant because sometimes we think of these sorts of end-of-life Uh, scenarios being for older people the other thing I guess is mental suffering and that's got a you know that's a fairly diverse way of defining what mental suffering is too those sorts of things are an issue aren't they age and the fact that it's mental suffering yes and they're very hard to pin down with the mental suffering because um, she said herself I I I've been, people think that when you're mentally ill, you can't think straight, which is insulting. And I get that. I understand what she's saying. But at the same time, euthanasia law, laws came in and you had to be mentally, uh, have mental capacity to say that you could make that decision. Where is the line on the spectrum that determines whether you are capable of making such a decision? And uh, it, it, she says these laws we've had in the Netherlands for more than 20 years, they're really strict rules and it's really safe. And then she says, but I understand the fears that some disabled people have about assisted dying and worries about people being under pressure to die. I don't think she realises that that is the key issue going forward in the next 20 to 30 years in the West. Uh, So the numbers of people who are responding to the availability of euthanasia, any thoughts there around the growth from uh, early days where, you know, there are all those promises that, oh, hardly anybody will take advantage of uh, having this opportunity to to have uh, voluntary assisted dying. That's grown substantially, hasn't it? Yes, look, I've got uh, friends who are doctors who work with the age, and they're not Christian doctors, actually. They're they're friends of mine, and they are very cautious about euthanasia in general, which is interesting because the line is often that doctors are all really for it. Well, that's not actually quite true if you uh, do the stats. But the key issue, I think, is that the cultural water will change to the point that the you-do-you personal autonomy thing will ramp up at the same time that there will be pressures on our health system. There will be pressures on our housing system. There will be lots of pressures. It's not just one pressure or one legislation that will 
uh, sort of push this forward. And that's been seen in Canada, which is a really interesting case study. Uh, Tom Holland, the, um, the not the Spider-Man, the other one, the famous historian, <laughs> uh, he put up a tweet that said, this really is post-Christian. And he surveys the Canadian attitudes to euthanasia, which are quite frightening in the trajectory they're taking. Christian and post-Christian. I know this is an area you love to reflect on because Mm -hmm. uh, when we think of the way that there is change now and a move towards a real acceptance of euthanasia, we might even call it a slippery slope because of where it's heading, but the Christian age, uh, that had some restrictions on it which protected the vulnerable. How do you reflect on, you know, how you say, well, this is a post-Christian type of an idea? Yeah, well, Tom Holland is really good because as, a, as a, coming at it originally from a secular historical point of view, he said that it was Christianity that gave dignity to every human being, regardless of their suffering. And he also said it was Christianity that gave meaning to suffering in this age. And if you take those two things out of the context, that suffering has no purpose in life about anything and that humans are made in the image of God, you take those things out and you suddenly are left with the individual rather than the community, and you're left with uh, your worth is determined by your, uh, w- what you can do to society. And in Canada, what was interesting that Holland said was that attitudes to euthanasia across areas of poverty, homelessness, mental illness, and being disabled were quite high, but they ramped up among the 18 to 34 year olds who are the post-Christian generation. So if you want to know what the culture is going to look like in 30 years time, look at who the 18 to 34 year olds now who will be running the country will be thinking. That's where it's going, I think. 18 to 30 year olds, and uh, interesting too, growing up in a prosperous, flourishing Australia. um, And this meaning in suffering, because uh, in the history of the whole world, uh, we have a history of dealing with hard times. There is suffering. There needs to be a resilience. That's why it takes the village to raise the child and to raise us all to a level of maturity. So if you've been raised in what is prosperous, flourishing Australia and you don't have the sort of resilience that's necessary here, maybe the meaning to suffering doesn't strike a chord as being so important anymore. Um, Everything's got to be good. Otherwise, well, why not just end it all? Yeah, look, I I do have great, you know, pity for people in the suffering stakes because my own father died of a very bad form of dementia uh, and it took about four or five years and it was awful at the end. And I looked at him and I spent time with him. But one of the uh, things that I noticed as we as a family cared for my father was that it changed us to have to put ourselves out to care for him. It gave us better mercy, better insight to what suffering is like. And if you say, all I want to do is get rid of all of that part of society, we don't in general like to look at suffering in other people because it disturbs and upsets us. But how we are to deal with people who are suffering and show mercy to them changes us. And we'll become a merciless society going forward if we keep down this trajectory. You raised a few thoughts on people who have disability and uh, there'll be those who'll reflect on what was happening uh, at the end of the First World War and through into the rise of Nazism and how people who weren't the perfect look uh, were uh, at risk of being euthanized. Um, you mentioned disabled people, but where's this heading, do you think? Because a slippery slope means this is getting worse. Uh, where do you think... This potentially is moving here in Australia, Steve. Well, I think if the Canadian uh, survey is similar, I think Australia's got some uh, frameworks like Canada. Uh, If poverty is increasing or homelessness is increasing and people have been offered uh, state-assisted suicide in Canada for those reasons, I can't see why it wouldn't happen here. I do think the issue is that personal autonomy, the you-do-you thing, that will paint it in a cultural way as this is your freedom and anything that stops your freedom in our culture is seen as bad and anything that stops the individual from personally doing what they wish to do and the state stopping them doing that outside of consent I think uh, is going to be seen as bad and that's why it will increase and I think as you have pressure on hospitals as you have pressure on uh, all our 
uh, not just our institutions, but our infrastructures, you're going to see these things rise. You mentioned the woman from the Netherlands, uh, just 29 years old, uh, but some listeners will remember news headlines and us talking about it on this program where even in the ACT there was talk of allowing teenagers to seek uh, voluntary assisted dying in the ACT. Now, to my understanding, uh, that was part of a working draft, and it appears to have been withdrawn, and I don't think it is uh, allowed for teenagers in the ACT. But just the fact that people are talking about it, doesn't that illustrate that there's a slippery slope here? Well, here's the interesting thing. I don't think it's that people in the community are necessarily talking about it. I think there's a certain framework of government that asks the question, puts it in the public square, and then says, oh, people are talking about it, and they're kind of testing the water on it. Don't think that's gone for good. In the same culture that says that a young person under the age of 16 has determining, fa- has determining rights over their gender, apart from their parents, you will find the state interacting and intervening more and more with younger and younger people over the years. That's just common sense in one sense, because that's how our cultural trajectory is going. I think if you look at the 18 to 34 year old stats in Canada, just assume that they will be the people writing the legislation, making the movies, uh, arguing the case in the public square, just as they will in Australia. I think we'll find ourselves on that same path. Come back to this uh, Christian, post-Christian, because uh, those Mm. listening to our conversation now, uh, I'm going to say they're firmly in the Christian camp and they want to flourish as Christian believers. They want their families, they want their communities to flourish, they want their nation to flourish. Uh, But the alternative to the Christian flourishing is this, as you say, autonomy over your own body. Um, You know, who cares if there's a God? It's all about you. And uh, there's a certain sense in which, uh, you know, human flourishing without God uh, based is, uh, you know, money and power and pleasure and celebrity and those sorts of things that become important. Come back to what it is, this meaningfulness, Steve, about being a Christian, even if you're a Christian in a post-Christian age, holding tight to those things that bring real flourishing under God. Look, if you're not a Christian listening to this and you are suffering, the first thing I want to say to you is that it isn't just that God knows that you're suffering. It's that in the person of Jesus, God has suffered. When God became a human being, he took on the risk of suffering. And then what you read as you read about Jesus is that he didn't come for a life of comfort and ease, but he came to be a suffering servant and suffered on our behalf. We don't worship a God as Christians who is immune or uncaring about our suffering because he too has suffered. And it's the meaning aspect of that Jesus went through suffering and came out the other side of it and calls human beings to both care for the suffering and find meaning, not in, not not that we as happy-go-lucky about suffering. As I watched my dad die, it was agonizing, but my hope was beyond his personal autonomy in this age because he lost his personal autonomy the day he went into a locked ward and if that's all we've got if we've got you get into a locked ward or you die and hope is over then no wonder our society is full of the anxieties it is Uh, you've got christians uh, through our history who've built the hospitals who've run the aged care facilities who care for uh, people in their dying moments i can't help but reflect on Jesus, who uh, Luke chapter 4, when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, uh, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free, and of course proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. All of those things are about an alleviation of suffering, aren't they? They are, and that's why uh, the Christians in the first century were so different to the non-Christians. They set up the hospitals, they looked after the pagans when there was a plague at the risk of their own lives. And you can read letters from Roman pagans who write to their wives from, say, far away at war, and they go, you're pregnant, if it's a son, uh, look after it, if it's a girl, expose it, meaning put it on the hillside and let it die. And Christianity came into a brutal 
context with this message that all humans are made in the image of God and are therefore worth looking after. So when you see things like the Calvary Hospital in the Australian Capital Territory be shut down by the government because it doesn't hold to certain things about euthanasia or it doesn't hold to certain things about abortion, Uh, and then you see the um, Australian Medical Association saying there's no room for ideology, there's a great irony in that because there's a a deep post-Christian ideology coming. And interesting, isn't it? Because uh, as the Christian believer, a biblical believer, uh, you're saying that it's God who gives us value and it's his example that deals with the suffering, the suffering servant come to alleviate the suffering. But if you take God out of the picture, all you're left is with government bureaucrats who are deciding who's valuable and who's not. Is that a simple way or is it too simple a way to even describe uh, where we're headed here? It's probably both, and right, in the sense of we've summed it up in a sentence, but there's truth to it, because uh, if you take a... You've got to have a transcendent view of who's in charge, and uh, I think if you take God out of the picture, something has to replace that that is the final arbiter of what human flourishing and identity looks like, and at the moment, that's government. So government is saying to churches, butt out. We are the arbiter of what's right and wrong on a moral level here, and you must take a back seat to where we're going. And I think that's when it gets dangerous because you can shape euthanasia as a cultural good and part of human flourishing, even at the time it takes human lives away from this world. And the biblical framework is very different to that on the basis of what a human being is. And the Bible also says that humans are not their own. They're not their own because they weren't created uh, by themselves. They were created by God. And then for the Christian, you're not your own because you were bought at a price, Jesus' price for your life. And so all Christians go into the world knowing that they don't belong to themselves as a created being or as a saved being. And that changes how you relate to absolutely everyone else. And it changes your public politic. And no doubt that's the uh, the necessary catalyst uh, that has to be there for talking to our uh, not only our ageing parents who might be vulnerable, um, but those in our community, our children around the dinner table, uh, just reinforcing these values of who we are before God because uh, the alternatives are pretty bleak. Um, what are your thoughts here, just quickly, on how you might even share these sorts of things in a conversation or within your family unit. Any thoughts here from you, Steve? Yeah, the first thing I would say is the church is going to model what it looks like to look after the weakest or the most vulnerable in its own midst, and it would model to the world that there is a different way to deal with this. And also, because you're getting, as I guess, you're getting this new gospel, this post-Christian gospel, if you have young people and teens in your house, don't assume that they have the same emotional revulsion to euthanasia for all sorts of clients that you do unless you actually share to them why we think life's important and why we think uh, God is the one who owns our lives because the messages they're getting are very opposite to that. But we model it in what we do and how we look after the poor and the needy and the vulnerable and we model it in and good teaching, I think, to our people about why God values human life. And at the same time say, that story, which is a good feel-good story about personal autonomy, if you take the mask off, there's a bit of a skull behind that. It's about death. It's about death. Uh, that's right. And it's why it's a heavy topic to be talking about, um, because, you know, the likelihood is, uh, apart from whether we might be raptured out of this world, uh, we are all going to one day die or be in a vulnerable place and others will be looking after us. Stephen McAlpine, always so good, just tapping a wonderful well of wisdom. Award-winning Christian author, pastor and national commentator for City Bible Forum. You can connect with Stephen. You can read his latest articles at stephenmcalpine.com stephenmcalpine.com and connect also with Stephen at citybibleforum.org and I might just add that if there's something in our conversation today that's triggered something for you you might want to call Vision Prayer 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME that's 1-800-772-936 of course there are other organisations too like Lifeline that you might like to call if there's something that has been triggered in our conversation today Stephen McAlpine thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us and your heart on 2020 Thanks Neil it was great to be with you 